We are going to start talking about genes and transcription and RNA synthesis and processing in a minute, but first let's go through the different types of RNA. Ribosomal RNA, or rRNA, makes up a lot of the ribosome. Since there are so many ribosomes, rRNA is the most abundant form of RNA. Messenger RNA, or mRNA, is the product of transcription of genes. Some genes are really long, so this is the longest type of RNA. Transfer RNA, or tRNA, are the molecules that bind to amino acids at one end and a codon at the other and they play an important role in protein synthesis, which we'll talk about in a minute. There are actually a lot of other types of RNA that are less relevant for your exam, but I'll just mention two. Snow RNAs are small nucleolar RNAs, which catalyze modifications on other RNAs, especially ribosomal RNA, to prepare them to function in ribosomes. Lastly, small interfering RNAs, or siRNA, are short double-stranded RNA molecules that use complementarity to bind to and inhibit their target RNAs, such as genes whose expression needs to be turned down or invading viruses. There are lots more types of RNA that have a lot of cool functions, but for most of this chapter we'll be focusing on these guys, the mRNAs. mRNA is basically used to send a message from the DNA to the ribosome so that a protein can be made. This figure shows a typical layout of an mRNA molecule. We'll come back to this later, but for now I want to go over the coding region, which is shown in orange here. This is where the codons are. Here's the codon table I showed you earlier. The first codon in the coding sequence of an mRNA, which is called the start codon, is almost always AUG, which codes for methionine. In prokaryotes, this codes for formal methionine. In some very rare cases, GUG can be used as a start codon, but it's so rare that you probably don't have to worry about it for your exam. The stop codons are UGA, UAA, and UAG, and these don't code for any amino acids, but instead are recognized by proteins called release factors and result in the termination of translation. Let's take a step back to see how this mRNA came from DNA. I'll cover two facts from the book here, both on page 75. Genes have a few parts to them at the DNA level. At the three prime end of DNA, which will be the five prime end of the mRNA that's being made, there are promoters and enhancers. Generally, promoters are within a few hundred base pairs of the transcription start site, whereas enhancers can be tens of thousands of base pairs away. Both are mostly upstream from the transcription start site, but they can also be found in the coding region, usually in introns. Transcription factors and other regulatory molecules can bind to specific sequences in the DNA to regulate transcription of genes. One of the most important is the Tata box, which is an area about 25 nucleotides upstream from the transcription start site in eukaryotes and is enriched for Ts and As. A protein called the Tata box binding protein binds here and recruits other transcription factors. There's also a sequence called the Cat box, which is about 70 base pairs upstream from the transcription start site and helps regulate transcription. Not shown here is another type of regulatory sequence called a silencer, which can be bound by proteins such as negative regulators to repress transcription. The coding region here is made up of exons and introns. The exons are the parts that will actually make it into the final mRNA, whereas the introns will all be removed in a process called splicing. Now it's important to keep in mind that the transcription start site here is not where the start codon is. If we compare this image to the one I showed you in the last slide, transcription begins here, and the start codon is a little further downstream. This yellow part is the 5' prime untranslated region, or UTR, and its main purpose is to regulate ribosome binding to the mRNA. There's also a 3' prime untranslated region. The 5' prime cap and poly A tail are added later and were not part of the original DNA sequence. There's not a whole lot you have to know about RNA polymerases, but here are the key points. First of all, they're numbered in the same order that they're used in protein synthesis. Type 1 makes rRNA, which is the first RNA in the ribosome, Type 2 makes mRNA, which gets to the ribosome next, and type 3 makes tRNA, which gets to the ribosome last. RNA polymerase type 2 is what opens DNA at the start of transcription, and none of them have any proofreading ability. Also, prokaryotes only have one type of RNA polymerase. I also want to mention this toxin called alpha amanitin, which is found in death cat mushrooms. It inhibits RNA polymerase type 2, which most notably causes liver failure. When RNA polymerase II first transcribes mRNA, it doesn't look like this nice colorful one here. It's first called a heterogeneous nuclear RNA, or HNRNA, and needs to go through a few processing steps in the nucleus before it's officially an mRNA. First, a 7-methylguanosine cap is added to the 5' prime end, with its 5' prime end connected to the 5' prime end of the mRNA by three phosphates. Next, the sequence AAUAAA at the end of the 3' UTR is used as a signal to add about 200 more A's to the end, which is called polyadenylation. Both the cap and the polyadenylation can regulate export from the nucleus, and they also prevent degradation by exonucleases and promote translation.
Third, the introns have to be spliced out, which I'll go through in more depth on the next slide. But before we go on, can you think of any examples of genes or types of genes that do not receive five prime caps? Since the five prime cap is only added in the nucleus, genes in the mitochondrial genome would never be capped. Okay, so let's talk about splicing now. This is how introns are removed from hnRNA. First, the transcript combines with small nuclear ribonuclear proteins, or SNRPs, to form a structure called the spliceosome. The SNRPs recognize specific sequences in the transcript and cause one part of it to bind to the other. This creates a loop called a lariat, which is then removed. This lariat contained the intron, so after doing this to all the introns, you end up with only exons. The concepts are probably more important than the details for your exam, but one detail that is important is that patients with lupus make antibodies to spliceosomal SNRPs. The LAC operon is a classic example from E. coli that we can use to understand the regulation of gene expression. An operon is a group of genes and the promoter that regulates them in bacteria. In this case, the genes being regulated are LAC Z, Y, and A, which are all needed to metabolize lactose. When lactose is available, E. coli should produce the genes needed to metabolize it, but when it's not available, there's no point in making these enzymes. Also, if glucose is present at a high concentration, the cell would rather use glucose than lactose, since lactose is a disaccharide composed of glucose and galactose, so the first part of lactose metabolism just produces glucose anyway. So the concentrations of glucose and lactose both regulate the expression of these genes, and I'll show you how. LAC I is another gene that codes for the repressor of the other LAC genes. This repressor is normally turned on, which means the other LAC genes are normally turned off. But when lactose is present, it binds to and inhibits the repressor, which allows the LAC genes to be active. From the other direction, glucose inhibits the catabolite activator protein, or CAP, and since CAP activates the LAC genes, having high glucose indirectly inhibits these genes. We've already covered a lot about introns and exons, but one last thing I want to cover here is the concept of alternative splicing. Exons can be combined in different combinations to create different versions of proteins, and exons often correspond to specific protein domains. For example, maybe there's a protein that has a DNA binding site, a catalytic domain, and two regulatory domains, which allow it to be repressed by other proteins. If for some reason a cell wanted only one of these regulatory domains to be present in certain situations, it can do that by either keeping or removing that exon in the mRNA. This saves a lot of space in the genome compared to having two entire separate genes, and alternative splicing is especially useful in viruses since they have such limited space for their genome. However, this is also an area in which mutations can cause disease, with a key example being beta thalassemia. In beta thalassemia, a gene that codes for the beta globin protein in hemoglobin has a mutation in part of the gene that normally allows the spliceosome to recognize the intron exon boundary. This mutation prevents proper splicing, so you end up with an incorrectly spliced mRNA that codes for a semi functional or dysfunctional protein. Now let's move from mRNA to tRNA. tRNAs are about 75 to 90 nucleotides long and form this cloverleaf secondary structure. The 3' prime end is called the amino acyl end and always ends in the sequence CCA. You can think of this as standing for can carry amino acids, since that's where amino acids attach. The opposite end contains the anticodon, which is complementary to a codon in mRNA. It's this matchup that allows each codon to correspond to a single amino acid. Before it can do its part in translation, the tRNA must first be charged by adding its corresponding amino acid to it. This is an ATP-dependent process, and it's catalyzed by an amino acyl tRNA synthetase enzyme. There's a different enzyme for each amino acid. Once the tRNA has been charged, initiation factor 2 is needed to get it to the ribosome so it can find its codon. Since this is a vital process, we can use antibiotics such as tetracyclines that target the 30S subunit of the ribosome and prevent attachment of the amino acyl tRNA to kill bacteria. I talked about tRNA wobble a few minutes ago, but I'll briefly go through it again. Basically, the idea here is that there are many amino acids for which multiple codons can all be used to get that same amino acid. For example, valine is coded for by all of these amino acids. Now, if you notice, they only differ in their third position. So if a DNA sequence initially has GUU, but the third location gets mutated to a C, an A, or a G, you're still going to end up with valine. Therefore, this third base doesn't really matter as much as the other two. Now this is not always the case, there are some amino acids that are only coded for by one codon, but by and large, the ones that have multiple codons corresponding to them only vary in their third position. Protein synthesis has three main steps, initiation, elongation, and termination. Initiation involves the assembly of the mRNA, the 40S ribosomal subunit, and the initiator tRNA, which will almost always be the tRNA loaded with methionine. This first tRNA and amino acid will always be in the P site. Proteins called initiation factors are needed to put these things together, and they use GTP as an energy source. The P site is where the growing peptide will be, 
The A site is where our next amino acid will come in, which has an anticodon that's complementary to the codon after the start codon. After this tRNA has arrived, the ribosomal RNAs will catalyze a peptide bond formation between these two amino acids. The last part of elongation is called translocation, and this is where the ribosome moves three nucleotides towards the three prime end of the mRNA. So the tRNA that's attached to the polypeptide ends up back in the P site. The A site is now temporarily empty, and the original tRNA, which is now detached from its amino acid, is in the E site, which you can think of as standing for empty or exit. The ribosome goes through this process over and over again, until it eventually reaches a stop codon. This is recognized by a release factor, which allows the protein to leave the ribosome. Now the prokaryotic ribosome is different from the eukaryotic ribosome. It has a 30S and 50S subunit, rather than the 40S and 60S that the eukaryotes have. Since it's different, we can use drugs that target it specifically and have little or no effect on our ribosomes. For example, aminoglycosides inhibit initiation by binding the 30S subunit. Chloramphenicol inhibits the peptidyl transferase activity of the 50S subunit, and macrolides block translocation. These are all discussed in more detail in the microbiology chapter. Once a protein is produced, it's usually modified before it's in its final form. One way this is done is by chopping off some amino acids from the end, which is called trimming. This is common in especially dangerous proteins, such as digestive enzymes, where you don't want them to be active unless their target is around, since they could damage parts of the cell or surrounding tissue. The enzymes themselves are produced in an inactive form called a zymogen, and a big piece has to be cut off by another enzyme for them to be activated. There are a few smaller covalent modifications that can be added to proteins, too. Phosphate groups are added or removed to turn a lot of enzymes on and off, like a light switch. Glycosylation is often used to change what a protein can and can't bind to, and hydroxylation is essential to form strong bonds between collagen molecules. Lastly, when a protein is damaged or no longer needed, it can be modified by adding a small protein called ubiquitin to it, which tags it for degradation by the proteasome, which I'll talk about more in the next lecture.